Hello, everybody. Welcome to this book launch for this wonderful book. Um, and we have here um, our panelists uh, all ready to go. So if um, all is uh, all is good, I'm going to start here. So uh, first of all, since this launch was organized by the Indonesia Project in the Crawford, Crawford School of Public Policy at the ANU College of Asia and the Pacific, uh, I think it is important that we acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians whose lands the Australian National University operates and pay our respects to the elders of the Ngambri and Ngunawal people past, present, and emergence. Welcome everybody uh, to this uh, book launch for uh, this book uh, that uh, was um, brought out from the 37th annual Indonesia uh, update conference held at the Australian National University or ANU in Canberra that was held uh, from the 6th to 7th of September 2019 uh, and the conference theme uh, for the 2019 Indonesian update that I was very fortunate enough to uh, have been able to attend uh, was from stagnation to regression Indonesian democracy after 20 years and of course that's where the book's title uh, published by uh, IC's publication came from. Uh, and today we've got an all-star cast uh, starting from Professor Emil Salim, who is going to discuss the book for us, first of all, and, and launch the book on behalf of the editors, um, Tom Power, which we have here online, and also Eve Warburton, Dr. Eve Warburton, based at um, uh, um, the Asia Research Institute at the National University of Singapore. Um, so before uh, I go on any further, um, I also I forgot to mention before that after uh, Professor Emil Salim, we will have uh, Professor Alan Hicken, uh, who's joined us all the way from University of Michigan. Thank you so much, Alan. I know it's like 11 p.m. for you over there. Uh, so thank you very much. And after that, we've got uh, Dr. Lauda Sharif, uh, who's joined us from Jakarta, who will be uh, doing the concluding um, uh, discussion remarks before we go to question and answer time, which will be in the last half half hour uh, of this book launch. Uh, so first of all, uh, before, uh, before I uh, go on any further, I want to introduce um, Professor Emil Salem. Of course, uh, needs no introductions at all uh, because we all know him. And um, thank you very much, pa, uh, Emil Salem, for joining us here. Professor Emil Salim is an Indonesian economist and former politician who has held a number of government positions over his long and illustrious career, including a number of cabinet minister positions from 1971 till 1993. He also served as a special advisor to President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, uh, and he was also the chairperson to, the president, to President Yudhoyono's advisory council from 2010 to 2014. Uh, Professor Salim's list of books and publications are frankly just too long to list here, um, as is the, num uh, the numerous national and international awards that he has received over the decades uh, for his environmental activism, economic scholarship, as well as service to the Indonesian nation, and we're truly honored to have him here to launch the book. Uh, and Professor Salim is now Professor of Economics at the University of Indonesia. So without further ado, Professor Salim, uh, thank you very much, and um, please you have the floor. Thank you. First, may I congratulate the Australian National University for its initiative to organize this seminar last year and to publish this book. It's very interesting that the book has been raising issues which are most pertinent for the today and the future Indonesia. It raises the issue of democracy at the lowest point. It discussed the political party which has lost its legitimacy. It criticized the electoral system, which in the, in the phrase of my coordinating minister of political affairs, is called the Chukam democracy. For it is in a situation where the media is not as well as we understood during the years of Russian Anwar, Mokhtar Rubis, and so on. And we lost another, Jacob Utama. And finally, we find that the weakening of the law rule of law by having eliminated the 
strategic role of KPK, of the corruption agency. These are the five important points that I draw from this book. The question then will become, what next? What can we expect in the future? As I see the future, judging to what is now today in a newspaper, it raised certain concern that our democracy is actually must take into account the current COVID-19. And yet the situation is that the Pelkada, the regional election is going forward in next December, ignoring the fact that the total province, province and district that is, by, that is endangered by the COVID has raised from 27 in June to 50 today. And the rise of COVID in the provinces are increasing. And yet the decision is taken to take the election at the district at the province level by December 2020. It reveals an ignorance of the fate, of the impact on the loss, possible loss, probable loss of the people. Second is, there is the low degree of budget absorption of the government. We face a crisis. Sustaining economy is important. And yet, out of the billions of rupiah, trillions of rupiah budget, the absorptive capacity after three quarters is only 36%. And the health ministry only lowest, in spite of the fact that we face an epidemic. And third is a situation in which the enforcement of the law regulation by the parliament completely ignore the reality that is changing in Indonesia. Recognizing the fact that the absorptive capacity of the government is low, 36%. Recognizing the fact the ombuds law in the parliament is being discussed in which the basic essence idea is to move the power of the regional government up to the central government. We have a governance issue today, and yet the idea is to enlarge the government, central government authority. Gentlemen, these are the only concerns that they have. The question is, is there a light at the end of the tunnel? My answer is yes. And the light is carried by the millennials, by the young. I don't expect dramatic change in this short coming years, but I expect a change by 2045. A new Indonesia will increase with a buoyant, buoyant with a dynamic democracy, initiated progress lead by the young generation of today. The militant millennials of today ignore the political parties. They don't want the cadres into political parties. They don't want to be active in political parties. They have their own way. And by the declining of the old regime, the political parties, which we are getting old, and by the rise of the new generation, I'm confident that Indonesia of the future will be better off than of today. Yes, we are facing the decline of the democracy today. But like my friend uh, Andy Bayuni mentioned, Indonesia is like dancing the pocho pocho. One step, uh, two step backwards and so on, on the rhythm of cha cha cha. My suggestion is, and my belief is, that we Indonesia must face a new pocho pocho dance. One step back, 10 step forward, and not the cha 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 rhythm, but the jazz rhythm stimulated, initiated by the youth. And this is the future of Indonesia 2045, in which democracy can prevail after we face 
this dramatic change in the years to come. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much uh, there, Professor Emil Salim, for, for your remarks and for launching uh, this book uh, 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 officially, Democracy in Indonesia, From Stagnation to Regression, edited, uh, if you've missed out on the information before, if you just joined us, um, edited by Dr. Eve Warburton, uh, who is now currently based at the Asia Research Institute at NUS, uh, and also Thomas Power, uh, who's at the moment uh, 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 based at the University of Sydney. Uh, and if you look there um, on the chat um, uh, function of, of your Zoom um, interface, uh, you will see there where you can get the book and further information about the book. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Emil Salim there for, uh, the, for the wonderful opening remarks. Um, and um, I would now like to invite one of the authors uh, for the book, uh, uh, from the book, uh, Professor Alan Hicken, who's of course joining us from the University of Michigan. Um, so Alan, thank you so much for joining us. And um, we're of course uh, talking briefly uh, about, uh, you know, general comments that you have about the book, but also in particular your chapter for this book, uh, which is Indo Indonesia's Democracy in a Comparative Perspective. Um, Alan, and um, I've got a number of questions here for you, and I think we can discuss your chapter and also your overall thoughts about the state of Indonesia's democracy uh, more broadly uh, from our conversation. Uh, but uh, first of all, Alan, uh, your chapter considers the quality of Indonesia's democracy in comparison to other uh, young democracies around the world, uh, and as well as to other countries in the region, such as uh, Singapore, such as Japan, um, in your chapter. Um, can I ask, first of all, what did you find um, in this chapter to, to give like a teaser to our audiences about the contents of this book? Um, how does Indonesia fare, particularly compared to the rest of the region, in a time now where, um, well, scholars, observers are starting to be a little bit more pessimistic about Indonesia's democracy. Um, are, we, are we right to have that kind of um, skepticism and a little bit more pessimism? That's a great, uh, um, a great question. And first, let me thank uh, Eve and Tom and, uh, for organizing this event, for producing a really interesting book. And uh, I appreciate being uh, uh, invited as an outsider, right? I, I'm, not, I, I'm a Southeast Asianist who works mostly on Thailand and the Philippines. I don't claim to be an Indonesian expert, but it was really, but you know, I follow and work with colleagues who, who study Indonesia. And so it was, it was uh, interesting and fun to, to sort of think about Indonesia, where Indonesia fits in a broader comparative uh, context. And first, I guess I wanna start by saying, uh, we need to give credit where credit is due. Um, when we consider Indonesia in a comparative light, there is a lot to be positive about. And just human nature, uh, our human nature is to sort of look for the negatives, but I want to start by acknowledging uh, the positives. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, almost no one would have predicted uh, 20 years of relatively stable, successful democracy uh, in Indonesia. And compared with the rest of the world, Indonesia looks uh, pretty good. It's uh, around the, the top tw uh, 30 to 40 percent of countries in terms of its liberal democracy ratings. Uh, if we look around Southeast Asia, there is not a single country I would trade uh, places with uh, if I'm thinking about democracy. Indonesia is in a better situation than any other Southeast Asian state outside of uh, Timor-Leste. And along with Timor-Leste, Indonesia is now the unquestionably the most democratic country in the region. Um, it's now enjoyed stable electoral democracy for two decades uh, without suffering a, a dramatic democratic collapse like we see in Thailand or a sharp erosion of democratic norms like we're seeing in the Philippines under Duterte. And if we look more broadly in the rest of the region, East and South Asia specifically, Indonesia is behind only the Northeast Asian democracies, Japan, uh, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, in terms of the, the level and quality of democracy. It's on par with Sri Lanka and Bhutan, and it's, I think, now firmly ahead of India, where we've seen democracy steadily erode over the last, uh, uh, last several years. So when we compare sort of contemporary Indonesia with the rest of the region and with the rest of the world, or with Indonesia of, of 20 years ago, uh, we, we have to start by acknowledging its impressive democratic uh, accomplishments. Um, they, they are uh, impressive. Um, uh, that said, uh, you know, the recent past, uh, you know, uh, should teach us that uh, we can't take democracy uh, for, uh, for granted. And that's, um, uh, and that's sort of where, where I think we are in this particular moment. I want to pick up on that, uh, Alan. So thank you for that. Um, in your chapter, um, you know, uh, from, from what you were saying before, that we shouldn't take 
uh, democracy for for granted, and we shouldn't, um, you know, we should continue to see um, democratic consolida consolidation as, as 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 a process. Uh, your chapter also warns that Indonesia is showing signs of serious democratic weakness or vulnerability. Um, based on what you've seen in other countries, what are you most worried about when it comes to the future of Indonesia's democracy? That's a great question. Let, let me, I guess, first put it in a bit of context. Um, again, as, as, we, as you sort of alluded to in the title the book alludes to, we're in a sort of global era where, um, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're no, democracy is no longer sort of marching forward, um, uh, you know, steadily across the globe. Um, we're in the middle of uh, what some people call sort of a, a global wave of autocratization where democracy is declining, backsliding in many, many countries, in some cases uh, collapsing completely. And uh, Indonesia is sort of in that, in that mix when you think about um, what the implications of that are for uh, for Indonesia, and I and I sort of find it useful to think in terms of decades for Indonesia. So during the first decade, sort of 1998 to 1999, Indonesia was again the democratic success story across any dem democracy indicator you want to look at. 2009 Indonesia uh, is much more democratic than, of course, 1999 Indonesia. And so what we'd hope uh, and, and perhaps expect is that in the next decade, right, Indonesia's democracy would expand and deepen. But we don't see that, right? Indonesian democracy doesn't expand, it doesn't deepen, it essentially stagnates uh, over the next decade with perhaps some evidence of the beginnings of a decline. And again, that's concerning. Um, and and two, two things particularly worry me. Um, uh, weaknesses of sort of checks and balances and, uh, and polarization. Uh, and I could talk more about either one of those or both of those if, uh, if, if we want. Please, please do. Yes. No, I was going to follow up on, uh, on whether you can think of like some pivotal uh, cases or examples uh, and, and to watch out for. Sure. Well, um, when I, uh, so when I think about threats to democracy, I like to think about, uh, I like to think in terms of constraints on would-be autocrats, right? Um, I think politicians are politicians everywhere, and if they can get power, they want, they want power. And so what is it that um, keeps political elite from trying to undermine, trying to unroll, to, to roll back uh, democracy? Uh, and, and, and so we're looking for those kind of constraints that are in a political system. And I worry that those constraints, those checks and balances, aren't as strong as they might be in Indonesia, and in some cases aren't as strong as they once were. So let me sort of refer to, I guess, three. So in terms of the formal institutions, civil society, and political parties are kind of the three things that I, uh, that as a, a sort of comparative political scientist, look at. And in terms of formal institutions, uh, Dr. Salim already mentioned, uh, um, uh, referred to some of these, and uh, but uh, the anti-corruption commission and the constitutional court I, were, were sort of two shining pillars in Indone of Indonesia's uh, institutions. The, they were success stories. They weren't perfect by any means, but they were really important checks on abuses of power. And in fact, they were a model for many other uh, new democracies. Other countries I work in would sort of hold those up as, here's what we could do, right? Here's the reforms we could undertake. And so in that context, the efforts to strip the KPK of, its, uh, of some important powers and undermine its independence and the proposed reforms of the constitutional court are concerning, right? They, they represent um, what could be an unprecedented attack on two of Indonesia's most important institutional protectors of democracy and good, good, good governance. And outside of informal, informal institutions, if we think about civil society, um, a robust active civil society can serve as a check on uh, would-be autocrats. Uh, it, it, they're the sort of sounding alarm. They pull the fire alarm when things start to look worrying, um, when democratic norms and institutions are being threatened, and then they mobilize against uh, those moves. And unfortunately, um, one thing that, that comes through pretty clearly in the data and in the book, in a lot of the chapters, is the environment for civil society has deteriorated, uh, in, uh, particularly over the last uh, 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 10 years. Uh, civil society organizations face more restrictions and repression than they did 10 years ago, uh, and particularly for uh, this is particularly true of certain religious groups. Uh, and the chapters in the book uh, document that there's been this worrying decline in uh, respect for civil liberties, freedom of expression, the ability to criticize the government, along with a rise in uh, repression on civil society, uh, government censorship, uh, and persecutions of critics. And then the last one I guess I'll just mention is, is uh, the weakness of Indonesian political parties. Again, uh, uh, Dr. Salim already mentioned, uh, I referred to this. Um, I, I'm a party scholar, so I'm biased. I just, you know, just, just to, to, uh, to, to put my cards to the table. But political parties are what make democracy work. They're the symbols, they're the work har horses, workhorses of democracy. They are hated everywhere around the world. We never like our political parties. They have to do the dirty work of, of, of democracy. But when they work well, 
we get better outcomes and voters are more likely to be satisfied with democracy. If they don't work well, then the legitimacy of democracy itself can be a casualty. And we, in fact, we know that democratic reversals are less likely in countries that have strong parties and a strong civil society. Uh, again, these strong parties and robust civil society raise the cost of defecting from the democratic bargain if you're a would-be uh, autocrat. And so, uh, and we also know that populists are less likely to emerge in uh, uh, and be successful in countries where parties are strong, uh, while weak party organizations and unattached electorates provide an open door for populists. V voters who are unhappy and, and unattached to parties are really a populist autocrat's dream, right? They can, they can get in there and, uh, and uh, do damage. Um, unfortunately, the news on the party front is not good for Indonesia. Uh, across the board, parties are weaker today than they were uh, 10 years ago. And again, uh, a few of the chapters uh, are, talk about this explicit in some detail. Uh, they're, weak, they're weaker organizationally than they were in the past. They're less programmatic uh, than they were. There's less differences, distinguishable district differences between parties. And the links uh, between uh, parties and voters have all but dissolved uh, in Indonesia. So I could go on, but suffice it to say that the weakness of Indonesia's parties, I think, is a serious vulnerability. Let me follow up um, on, on that then, Ellen. You're, um, you're a, comparator, a comparivist, and um, I uh, am wondering, just from listening to what you were talking about before, for a country uh, in, the, in the midst of uh, a democratic uh, regression or democratic decline like um, Indonesia, can they reverse their trajectory and, and turn around to strengthen their democratic institutions? Can we, can we turn regression into progression? What do, what do you think here? Yeah, so um, if, if, if the optimist in me wants to say we're not in the midst, we're at the beginning, right? So it's it, the, the momentum has started, but it's not, you know, it's 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 still in the early stages, and it can be arrested. Um, and I guess the, the, way, the way the way I would think about it is to think about the the other factor that I didn't talk about. Um, start there, uh, polarization, right? Um, so I talked about the institutional checks and balances. Polarization is something that is is present in Indonesia, but Indonesia's not nearly as polarized as some democracies are, uh, uh, including my own. Um, uh, and, and polarization is such a danger to democracy because of the way it separates society into these mutually antagonistic groups. It's us versus them, good versus evil, right? Darth Vader versus Luke Skywalker, whatever it is. Uh, the other side is not just your political opponent, right? They're your enemy. They're illegitimate. They're an existential threat. You have to destroy them. And when that kind of polarized environment takes hold, then some people become willing to sacrifice democratic norms and institutions to defeat the other side. And again, Indonesia um, uh, uh, is not as polarized as some democracies, uh, uh, and, and that's some signs for hope, right? The, 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 the rhetoric in the last two elections was fairly polarizing, but after the elections, Indonesia's political elite still seem willing to be able to come together, work together, uh, witness Prabowo joining Jokowi's coalition, becoming defense minister. Uh, but there's just no guarantee that patronage politics are going to continue to dampen the effects of polarization, right? Thailand is a perfect example. Uh, Thailand in the 70s and 80s was, uh, there were no permanent enemies, no permanent friends. Uh, patronage politics was sort of the name of the game. Even, uh, even when there was some polarized elections, after the elections, we saw very much what you saw in Indonesia, sort of everybody coming together, coalitions of, of, uh, of political opponents joining together to run the country. That changes uh, dramatically in the 2000s and 2010s, uh, where uh, polarization takes hold and really destroys Thai democracy and, um, uh, and, uh, and uh, destabilizes Thai, Thai politics, Thai society for two decades. So I, we, we can't, I don't, I don't think we can, um, we, we have to be cautious about where, where Indonesia is. It's not as bad as it could be, but it, but uh, it, that doesn't mean that, that the status quo is going to hold. And, uh, and it's, it's the case that polarization and polarized rhetoric have increased over the last 10 years, right? Much of the rhetoric coming out of the government and directed at groups that deems to be threats um, uh, is, is very polarized in its, in its language. And those, and, the, and those threats are then used to justify some of the attacks on civil society and civil liberties I mentioned earlier. So, so what do we do about this, right? I, I wish I had a magic formula. I wish I, I wish I could sort of say this is the one thing that, that we should do and, and everything will be right. Um, Democracy is messy, it's challenging. Uh, there's winners and losers. Um, uh, and what we want to work towards is a system where, and I, and I say we, because I'm talking about my own system as well, um, uh, we want a system where winners show restraint and losers give their consent. So I, I'd point to a couple things. Um, vigilance and voice, I guess, to, to pick two V words. 
uh, in, in this era uh, uh, that we're in right now, democracy rarely dies all at once. Right, it's not it's, it's not the tanks that roll in and democracy's you know uh, you know it is dead overnight. It's death by a thousand little cuts, uh, um, and uh, you know it's political leaders taking uh, taking advantage of opportunities. COVID nineteen maybe being one of them uh, to uh, attack, undermine, uh, push against democratic norms and institutions. So that means we've got to be on the watch for and willing to call out and willing to criticize and mobilize against even small deviations from democratic principles. Um, and that's especially true if it comes from our own side, right? Um, it's easy to call out the other side as being undemocratic. Am I willing to do the same when I see that coming from my own, you know, my own, my own group? Uh, so we need to be willing to defend the legitimacy of civil liberties, uh, 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 the, legit the legitimacy and the civil liberties of our opponents, call out and refuse to support politicians and groups that use divisive language. Uh, and that stuff I think could be helped along with uh, in Indonesia, reforms to strengthen political parties. Uh, again, Dr. Salim mentioned the electoral system. Uh, reforms there could help strengthen uh, and recalibrate the little Indonesian elections in a helpful way. Um, uh, a, a watchful and critical media. And then, uh, again, let me just return to an active pro-democracy civil society that's willing to engage in mass mobilization. Well, if we look across the globe, where we see threats to democracy being beaten back we often see mass mobilization occurring in support of democratic norms and institutions at the sort of core of those efforts. So you can think of Bolivia, Poland, uh, Malawi, and Indonesia certainly has that capacity. Indonesian civil society certainly has that capacity to be along with political parties and other actors, a check on um, uh, attacks against or the erosion of democratic norms and institutions. Do you think from your observations of recent trends, Alan, do you think Indonesia will will get to that point, will, will it get to that, where um, in order to prevent Indonesia from, say, further regressing in, in its democracy, do you see uh, civil society actors, young people, um, and you know, pro-democracy activists generally, you know, eventually having to, for instance, take to the streets? Do you think it will get that bad? Oh, well, I don't see that as that bad. I see that as proactive, right? It's a, it's a prophylactic. So, um, uh, so I, I do see that's probably necessary, uh, that, um, uh, that governments, um, uh, if, if governments are not constrained by institutions, then governments are constrained by, uh, you know, by uh, sometimes the threat of unrest. And so that is um, uh, a reminder that, that, that they're responsible to the people. And so that can come at the ballot box, that can come through uh, the people's representatives and other institutions, that can, that can also come through uh, mass mobilization in a peaceful way that, uh, that communicates to the to a political elite that attacks against uh, democratic norms and institutions are going to be costly, right? That people aren't going to ignore and roll over uh, uh, for uh, e even for a political elite that they otherwise support. Thank you so much, Professor Alan Hicken from um, University of Michigan. Now I want to turn to the book's editors. Uh, so hi Eve, hi Tom. Uh, First of all, I guess before I launch into some of the chapters in the book and some of the themes that we can expect from the book, um, as the uh, you're the book's editors and also the organizers for last year's Indonesia Update Conference, um, on which the papers of this book uh, were first presented in September of last year. Um, can I ask, first of all, um, Eve or Tom, either one of you can start answering this question. What inspired you both as uh, the editors to pick this topic of, um, you know, uh, Indonesia's democratic stagnation and regression? Um, as, as we know, those of us who are familiar with the annual Indonesia update conferences um, at the um, uh, ANU would know that every year uh, the organizers would pick a, and on behalf of the Indonesia program at the Crawford School would pick a, a, a new theme, a different theme. And this, uh, for last year, you picked the topic of democratic stagnation and regression. Uh, why? Why this topic? Oh yeah, thanks Charlotte. And let me just first just thank uh, Professor Imo Salim for his comments before and for launching the book. Uh, we're very honoured that he joined us today uh, and he picked up on some very important sort of findings of the book, but I'm also really glad that he ended on a positive note. Uh, there was, there's a lot to be pessimistic about when reading this book, but um, it's always important, as he said, to focus on the light at the end of the tunnel. So, and, and thank you as well to Alan for providing that really important um, comparative context for our discussion, for the book and for our discussion today. Um, so, so why democratic decline? Well, Tom and I uh, had noticed this really important shift in the kind of um, tone of political analysis coming out of scholars both within and outside of Indonesia 
uh, when it comes to Indonesia's democracy. So at the end of the SBY years, so in 2014, that a kind of consensus had emerged, and Alan picked up on this, that um, Indonesia's democracy, although reform had kind of ground to a halt, although it was sort of seen as, seen as a kind of stagnating democracy, uh, it was democracy that was considered stable, albeit sort of low quality compared to, to some of the more established democracies in, North, in Northeast Asia. Um, and then when Jokowi was elected in 2014, what most people thought was, you know, not that he would be this sort of enthusiastic liberal advocate for democratic reform, but he would be someone who would protect the status quo. Um, and so it was surprising, to, it has been surprising to a lot of people to see this kind of over the last five years as sort of mounting evidence uh, that Indonesia's democracy is in fact eroding. And it's eroding at a pace, I think now, that not many people predicted. So what we wanted to try and do in this book is to, was to kind of identify where the most sort of proximate threats were or uh, are to Indonesia's democracy and also kind of try to locate where the sources of resistance might be. So I guess what we're trying to do here is to use what uh, to comment or to use Alan's words is to try to identify some of these sort of thousand cuts um, that, that are kind of eroding or chipping away at the quality of Indonesia's democracy. And I want to add that while the book was written before the pandemic, all the, or every, it went to press before the pandemic sort of broke out in Indonesia and all around the world, I think many of the book's findings help us to sort of understand uh, some of the shortcomings in the government's response to the pandemic. And I think actually, and we can talk about this more in Q&A, what this crisis has done is probably unleashed um, or may, maybe given more space to and, and more justification to the actors and the anti-democratic actors and the forces that we identify in the book. Um, so let me just briefly explain and, um, the, how the book is organised. So it begins with this sort of comparative discussion about the quality of Indonesia's democracy. And that's really important, to, as Alan said, to keep in mind that Indonesia's democracy, in comparison to the region other and its neighbours, um, does still look good. Uh, but that's sort of a low base, right? I mean, we're talking about a region which is full of sort of stable authoritarian regimes, hybrid regimes, and, and, and countries like, the, like Thailand and the Philippines, where you've seen this dramatic kind of... Um, uh, reversals or dramatic sh sharp kind of regressions in the quality of democracy. But still, it, it's a, we have to keep that in mind. Uh, so it opens with a discussion by Alan and also another comparativist, Dan Slater, who looks at the historical kind of antecedents of Indonesia's democratic strengths. And so that's really important. And then we get down into sort of these different arenas of democratic decline and our kind of country experts have a much more pessimistic, in fact, take on, the, on, on what's going on in Indonesia's democracy. So it starts with a, um, a look at political polarization and the rise of populist mobilization, how these two kind of twin forces um, are eroding democratic norms and democratic institutions. Then we look at um, this really important aspect of a healthy democracy, which is democratic support from within the population. And so we have uh, survey experts that look at kind of dig deeper into this sort of fact of um, how much Indonesians uh, are committed to and support um, their, de their democracy. Then in section uh, four, we look at sort of the institutions that form the kind of the backbone of a healthy democracy, a free autonomous media, representative parties, and the protection of core civil liberties like freedom of expression. And then in part five, uh, we look at law and security. And we look especially at the politicization and erosion in the quality of, of institutions like the KPK, the courts. Uh, and we also look at, uh, at the rise of sort of non-state security actors in the form of vigilantism. And I haven't covered everything here. I'm just sort of you know, giving you a few highlights. And so basically, based on the work of our contributors, our outstanding cast of contributors, um, and our own research, the finding, and it's pretty pessimistic, is that on a whole range of measures, Indonesia's democracy is in the midst of a really, we would say, very serious democratic decline. And I should add here that what Alan said is really important. It always depends on the lens, that, the comparative lens that you're using. And the book looks very much at the last five years. You know, so what's happened since the end of the Udiono era. And so on, you know, when we look at that, particular time frame, um, our contributors are very concerned uh, about what's going on. So we've seen, for example, they, what they document is an increase in the intimidation and harassment of dissenting voices, people who criticise the administration. We've got a less critical and a less partisan media landscape, and Prof. Emil Salem also mentioned that. Um, it's not that we don't have, you know, fantastic and critical journalists in Indonesia, we have a lot, uh, but the space for them to kind of publish um, critical pieces uh, is, is, is narrowing. And then, of course, we have the erosion of democratic practices within political parties. That's an important contribution from Marcus Mitzner. And so this is all makes it sort of harder and more difficult to kind of locate sources of democratic resistance. Uh, what we find, I think, with the most worrying um, finding of the book is that when we try to sort of locate where is the biggest threat, like who's doing this, like where is this coming from? The result is that we're finding erosion coming from such a wide range of actors. So from the elite, from above, from political and bureaucratic elites, 
but also from below, you know, illiberal sort of social movements, illiberal activities by religious and civil society organizations, enhanced status of vigilante groups. Um, and at the same time, the civil society actors who we kind of used to depend on, you know, used to work quite with the media to sort of defend Indonesia's democratic institutions like the Cafe Car, for example, from attacks by the elite. Their capacity and their willingness to, 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 to be these kind of democratic bastions is reduced. And there's a couple of reasons for that. But one is, of course, the polarization and the partisanship that Alan uh, discussed. And I thank him for really outlining that so well. Um, but also, of course, you know, even sort of NGOs and activists who haven't become more partisan in this sort of more polarized atmosphere um, is that the space, the state has just become more and more determined over the last five years to constrain dissent. To, to limit free and open public debate and to kind of chip away the checks and balances that, that Indonesia's had over the last 20 years. And so, it's, as I said, it's harder to locate these sort of um, sources of resistance. Um, and, and, and yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there because I want Tom to be able to, to, to chip in as well. But that's sort of in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Eve. Um, let me let me turn to uh, Tom there uh, because you know I'm um, following up on what Eve was saying before about the the forces of uh, that that is eroding um, Indonesia's democracy and the quality of Indonesia's democracy. Do you have anything to add there, Tom? Yeah. So um, I think when we look at the elite forces, the sort of the elite-led dimensions of democratic decline, um, there might be three particular issues that are worth paying attention to okay and obviously i want to encourage people to go and buy the book and, and read it <laughs> um so this is a sort of a summary and i think there are there's much more detail that we can go into once we sort of get into into reading the volume itself here but the first the first issue i would draw our attention to are the sort of the structural shortcomings that have been inherent since indonesia's period of democratic transition at the end of the new order um and in particular we have deficits in the rule of law that the rule of law was never truly established in Indonesia, despite efforts such as the, um, the erection of the KPK or the MCAR. Um, this has been a major shortcoming that I think most Indonesians and most foreign observers of Indonesian politics would be very well aware of. And so we've never sort of seen uh, a, a, an effective set of institutions that can guarantee elite accountability in a truly democratic sense. Um, and I think one of the major reasons for this is that we have sort of norms um, that have, have determined the way in which Indonesia's democratic consolidation has taken place. In particular, the problem of endemic corruption, which has bound virtually every elite actor into uh, an enormous patronage network. And this is, of course, a problem we see in many democracies, not purely in Indonesia. So echoing what, what Alan has said, you know, this is a global problem, not an Indonesian problem. Um, but also the, the mode of transition at the end of the new order. So the integration of the vast majority of new order elites into the democratic regime. Okay, so we had the sort of the perpetuation of uh, the, the wealth and power imbalances which had been, had been established during the new order um, post-1999. Uh, and this, of course, gets us into the discussion of sort of oligarchy as the primary basis for the way in which power is, is wielded in Indonesia. Okay, so there's a a vast literature on that. I think, in fact, one of our contributors, uh, Abdul Mugis, recently edited a volume in Indonesian about oligarchy. So, a uh, plug for his book as well. Um, the second issue I think we should draw attention to uh, are the ways in which the sort of the self-interest of elites have perhaps uh, eroded democracy. Again, talking about this sort of this death by thousand cuts, but eroded democracy in a way which is not deliberate but eroded democracy by extension of their own efforts at self-maximization. So one of the good examples of this would be Marcus Smitsner's contribution on the political parties. And this is also something that Pat Emil and Alan have just spoken about. So here we have a problem where efforts to guarantee elite domination over political parties sort of internally have of course eroded their, their key functions of interest articulation and aggregation from constituents okay so increasingly divorcing the parties from civil society um, this is again a problem we see right around the world but it's it's accelerated quite significantly particularly in the last five years and on the other side of the ledger we have the sort of the media oligopoly which is something that, that Ross Tapsell's chapter addresses um, which has meant that the vast majority of media owners are more or less beholden to the interests of those in government and in many cases they are actors within government 
So again, a core institution of democratic about accountability has really been emasculated as a result of this process. So I think these are not sort of deliberate efforts to sabotage democracy, but they are, they are ways in which democracy is being eroded by the extension of sort of elite, um, intra-elite politicking often. But I think that the most important issue, and this is something that we've picked up, um, especially over the past five years during the Jokoi presidency, is the way in which political elites are turning their attentions towards the institutions of democracy themselves and very overtly looking to, to undermine and sabotage those institutions. Now, initially, I think much of the concern about this sort of process focused on what might be termed um, uh, extra institutional populist actors, so people like Prabowo Subianto, not someone who at that time in 2014 was actually a member of government, but an elite figure who was waging a sort of a populist authoritarian campaign, who then having been defeated in 2014, sought through his coalition of allies in parliament to wind back subnational democracy and undermine various other elements of Indonesia's democratic landscape. Okay, so that was a sort of an extra institutional or extra government challenge to, uh, to the democratic status quo. But then, of course, with the consolidation of Jokowi's presidency, we've seen actors within government, including the president himself, I think, um, quite uh, overtly challenge, undermine and erode key institutions of Indonesian democracy. And there are a few elements that might be mentioned here, but um, one, of course, would be the criminalization of critical speech and oppositional speech. And this is something that Ken Setiawan has written about uh, in, our, in our volume. Um, and we've also seen efforts to sort of coerce and co-opt political parties, um, grassroots organizations, non-governmental organizations, um, subnational executives. So the people who are leading Indonesia's uh, sort of regions um, and also most, I think, uh, fundamentally, most importantly, in recent times, the KPK. Um, and I would, I mean, I, I accept very much what Alan was saying about the efforts of civil society potentially to mobilize and to challenge the democratic regression that we're currently seeing. But we might assume that the student protests of late uh, 2019 were such an attempt. These were the largest pro democracy um, protests since the fall of the new order. And unfortunately, um, the government dealt extremely handily with them. And I think also in this particular you know, moment, this COVID pandemic uh, era, um, the government is spending so much on security forces and on law enforcement, much less on healthcare, as Pat Emil mentioned, and that this is effectively perpetuating the capacity of the government to potentially clamp down on any civil society activism. So going forward, I think that there are a few key things we will need to watch out for in terms of sort of elite led regression. Firstly, um, the proposals for winding back regional autonomy, which have been mooted and then have sort of fallen out of popular discourse, particularly during the pandemic. I think this is a really important issue. And if we do see some winding back of, of, of autonomy de era, uh, that would be a major blow, perhaps the most substantial blow to Indonesian democracy yet and also the efforts to expand powers for military and for the police alongside the current proposals for reform to the MCAR. So I'll leave it there because I think we, we want to move on with the, the presentation, but definitely the increased role of elites in leading Indonesia's democratic regression, I think, is the most startling element of this process that we've seen in the last five years. Thanks for that, Tom. And, um... Um, and for elaborating in, in great detail, you know, not only the, how the authors in the book uh, address, you know, what you're uh, talking about before in terms of elite efforts to actually, um, you know, uh, yeah, uh, to, to actually uh, undermine Indonesia's democracy. Um, and uh, what, what I do want to follow up on, uh, I know that some chapters in, in the book also talks about this notion of democ um, uh, democratic uh, regression from uh, the decline of democracy from below, right? And this was something that was also implied by what were you saying. Uh, Eve, I might ask you this question then. Um, what, what is it, you know, for those of us who are not so familiar about this, and this is something that the authors in the book um, sometimes talk about as well, what is what do you what do we mean by uh, decline of democracy from below? Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? 
Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll make it really quick so we can give plenty of time to um, put load us out if, to offer some comments. But basically what the comparative literature on democracy tells us is that, you know, for democracy to be sort of sustained and to deepen, you don't just need state actors to kind of build and protect democratic institutions. Um, you know, what you need is a society as well, sort of outside of the state that uh, supports, uh, demands democratic accountability and, and can help cultivate kind of norms of tolerance uh, support for equal participation for all citizens uh, and the like. And so you need a robust civil society. Uh, and as I said, the kind of this demand for democratic government. And so what we do in the book is um, our, some, of, some of our authors kind of investigate what's going on in civil society, uh, what's going on amongst the voting population in terms of their support for um, democratic uh, uh, institutions and, and their kind of cultivation of norms. So, for example, this is kind of um, accepted sort of, it's a fact really that for, you know, for the last decade and a half, Indonesians have reported in polls that they are, you know, almost unanimously in favour of democracy over authoritarianism. They support direct elections, they love direct elections. Uh, and so that's a really positive, I think, kind of story about Indonesia's democracy. Um, but what we do is um, our survey experts, Burhanuddin Muftadi and Diego Fossati, and they will, um, Burhan will speak on Friday about this, is they kind of interrogate that a bit more and they say, well, okay, yes, Indonesians support democracy, but is their satisfaction with how democracy works contingent? On something else and so they look at kind of you know do electoral losers people who support losing candidates you know are they less satisfied with democracy and spoiler alert what Han finds that they are especially in 2019 it's a fantastic chapter so please tune in on Friday when he explains his findings uh, and also what Diego finds is that actually Indonesians have different conceptions of democracy it means different things to different people and depending on how you understand democracy you're going to have different kind of responses to it and feelings about it and support for it so I really encourage people to kind of look at those really innovative chapters there. Um, but also uh, what our chapters do is look at kind of illiberal activities within really important civil society organizations. Uh, Nava Norania looks at NU. So, so much of the literature that came out over the last couple of years on polarization is very much focused on what's been going on in the kind of more uh, Islamist, more puritanical kind of right-wing organizations. What she does is she looks at what's going on in NU. How has NU responded to this ideological threat that they see from organizations like Hatei and PKS, uh, and how they've become kind of increasingly militant and indeed sometimes illiberal in, the, in, the, in their activities and their efforts to try and defend their ideological turf. And it's a really fascinating chapter and really important one. Um, and then so, uh, lastly, I'll just point to kind of some of the work that um, uh, uh, both Nava and Sana also look at kind of religious vigilantism. So this is this um, kind of trend that Sana tracks Sana Duffy tracks in kind of the increasing uh, prevalence of vigilante attacks and vigilantism at the community level and that the kind of um, religious organizations from FPE, but also to um, larger organizations, mainstream organizations like NU, um, how they're kind of policing a wider range of social um, and moral kind of religious offenses. And what's so critical about Sana's work and so important for today, I think, in Indonesia is to understand that this vigilantism has kind of increased at the same time the state's presence has increased in Indonesia. An increasing number of police officers, you know, stationed around villages and Kachamatan and all around the, um, is, is happening at the same time. And so this idea that actually we're getting kind of non-state non -state and state security actors working in tandem. And the reason I wanted to raise her chapter is because it helps us really understand one aspect of the government's response to the pandemic. You know, this government has handed um, more and more responsibility for managing the pandemic, not to health uh, experts, as Emil Salim mentioned as well, uh, but just as Tom said, to security, uh, that security arms of the state, military and police. But what we've also seen is highly unusual if you look at what's going on in other countries. Um, over the last few weeks, there's sort of, um, sort of outsourcing, I guess, or kind of handing over responsibility to local gangsters, to Preman, uh, and to kind of... Uh, community policing organizations. And what the government seems to be doing is intentionally blurring the boundaries between formal state security arms and community-based non-state security arms um, and mobilizing kind of untrained um, citizens to police fellow citizens. And Indonesia has quite a long history of doing that, but we're seeing that kind of, um, that tendency, that trend increasing. And so part of our book uh, looks at that. Um, I'll leave it there because I really want to hear what Pat Lauder has to say about the Thank book, you but... so much. Thank you so much for that, Eve. And we're very lucky uh, to, of course, have uh, Dr. Lauder Sharif here. Uh, we've been talking about the KPK a lot and one of the, you know, example, a prime example, one of the organizations that has been undermined um, over the last uh, couple of years. Um, and, uh, of course, today to discuss the book, we have Dr. Lauder Sharif, and I'll just do a brief introduction um, of, um, of you, Pat Sharif. Um, Palau de Sharif was, of course, the commissioner for the Indonesian 
Asian Anti-Corruption Commission, or the KPK, from 2015 to 2019. Um, and before he joined the KPK, Pashari was a senior lecturer at Hasanuddin University uh, in the Faculty of Law, uh, which is located in Makassar in Indonesia. Um, he taught environmental law, in, international environmental law, and developed anti-corruption and environmental law clinics in several law schools in Indonesia. He also served as one of the principal trainers of the Supreme Court of Indonesia in the area of environmental law and judicial code of conduct since early 2000. Um, Dr. Shari spent seven years living in Australia as he pursued his graduate education uh, under the Australia Award Scholarship, uh, which was formerly known as the Australian Development Scholarships. He uh, obtained his master in law at the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, and later his PhD in law at the University of Sydney. Uh, Dr. Sharif is now the executive director of Kamitraan, or the Partnership for Governance Reform, a non-partisan organization that works with various governmental agencies, NGOs, and other individual bodies to achieve governance reforms at different levels in Indonesia. We are truly honored to have you here uh, with us to discuss the book. So uh, please take it away, uh, Pat Lode. Thank you very much, uh, Charlotte, and for the very long introduction. So, yeah, because the title of the book was, I tried to push it in question mark. So I think so from stagnation to regression that I say, yes, Indonesian democracy in regression. So, uh, but thank you very much for the positive note from Alan. Uh, but it is quite difficult for me and Pa Emil, for example, as an Indonesian who live here in Jakarta, actually, to feel those positive notes. Uh, but I think so, what I want to say today it is actually try to congratulate uh, the authors of the book. And I think this is the most difficult uh, task for me to find the pictures of every of you, you know, every one of you. Uh, <laughs> I even actually tried to contact Lydia to find uh, uh, Mohammed Pasa's uh, actually face, but I couldn't find it. And the one and only, that's a uh, sorry Pasha, <laughs> it is the one and only picture that I have on the web. Uh, but again, congratulations. Uh, this is a very good book. Uh, 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 and I think so. I, even me, I learned a lot from this book. Uh, uh, I would like to congratulate all the, the authors of the book. Uh, I really want to comment on every chapter of the book, but uh, somehow I only have like a 10 minutes. So I just want to concentrate actually in Tom's uh, uh, article, which is I like the title the most. <laughs> Assembling Accountability, Law Enforcement Politicization, Course and Executive Aggrandizements under the Jokowi Administration. So the key word is selling, a cursions, aggrandizing and politicization, all the good words. And I think this represents my feeling about democracy in Indonesia. And I really want to give like Laude Muhammad Sari footnotes on this particular book, but also more specifically on this particular chapter. Uh, I think it is important for us actually to look at the root of democratic regression in Indonesia, uh, which is according to my limited observations, maybe because of this. Every election of public official always involves illegal money and illegal transactions. And I think uh, uh, Burhanuddin Mutadi already, already actually make very good uh, 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 a book on this as part of his PhD thesis. Uh, uh, but this is actually confirmed with what I'm doing during my terms in KPK. For example, for buying is three terms undermining the year election of KPK. And even the Chief Justice of Constitutional Court, the prophet of Indonesian law, it is taking bribe for Pilkada. I mean, this is unimaginable, like the Chief Justice of High Court of Australia or the Chief Justice of US Supreme Court to take money. But this is actually happening, and it is not the last. During my terms, even actually, I caught red-handed one of the justice of the, of the, uh, uh, of the Constitutional Court. So this is a tragedy. So when actually Tom said 
we may actually have the structure of democracy in Indonesia, but the rule of law, it is still under the carpet. We are still really, really bad. And this is actually trying to give you some kind of like empirical evidences for those who are actually doing politics and democracy in Indonesia. During my terms, I got 400,000 envelopes ready to be distributed. I mean, this is not a real democracy. This is the comedy of democracy and we, sorry, Alan, for your positive note, we've been actually praised this Indonesia, it's one of the most ex good example of democracy in Southeast Asia. And this is not me saying it, but actually our minister itself. He said that 72% of governors and bupati and wali kota financed by Chuko. They thought actually mentioned by PML. But I think this is not exclusively Indonesia. United States, Australia, in many other developed countries also financed by Chuko. But not up to the level of actually buggy buggy envelope or distributing envelope like this. So uh, actually, the, 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 we actually have a study. So that's why uh, based on CAPEC our study, but if you want to be, <clears throat> to be a Bupati in a small Kabupaten, that at least you have like 50 billion. Or in Java, you have at least to have like 100 uh, billion rupiah. It is not US dollars or Australian dollars. And this is the evidences of political corruption in numbers. The governors, the ministers, the Angota DPR and stuff. And this maybe it is kind of like abstract, but we can make it real. The real face of political corruption, it is there. I mean, PKS, Democrat, PDIP, Golkar, P3, Nasdem, Pan, PKB, Hanura, it is equally represented. And even actually you can go, those people, the richest and the most powerful, and even this what I don't like most. Even the case of democracy, it is of reformers actually equally corrupt. Look at them, they are very, very young. And it is for example, I just give you an example for this. Uh, Adriat Madhvi Putra, he just actually trying to become a new mayor of Kendari, which is in my own kampung, uh, for example, just to replace his fathers. And it has become a new a new way of Indonesian democracy from father to son to daughters, even to granddaughter, for example. And they end up in KPK hand. So that's why if we actually look at the corruption perception index in 2017, Indonesia, we are still 40, which is still very corrupt. And, but if you divide those, which part is actually the lowest score, it is World Justice Project 21. Because our law enforcement agency, it is still the same. And of course, the Farity Democracy Project. And patch, which is real, the collusion between corruption in political and law enforcement. And if we actually look at the root cause of this problem, when I was in KPK, we have this uh, uh, study uh, and special project with political party with LIPI. And the root cause was we found keuangan partai politik. I mean, the financial of political party, it is only God knows where they come from and where the money actually goes. The code of ethics within political parties is very weak. 
the recruitment process it is weak they even actually taking someone from outside their political party if they have the money to support them for the party or governors yes i never imagine for example the democrat actually nominating someone from the republic united states but it is happening here in indonesia so indonesian democracy it is actually a comedy if you actually look at into it and the result of political corruption it is this number because it is involved money so out of 575 members of a parliament 262 members are business women and businessmen and now we have the president's businessmen we have ketua mpr businessmen and almost every governors so it is prone to conflict of interest and the bitter evidence of it the revision of kpk law just takes two weeks to revise it the revision of mineral and coal and mining only about like a three four weeks done and now they come up again with job creation bill draft ruu cipta kerja with omnibus law so since now i think never put your hope on the pr and the presidents and also the shrinking of public space the weaponization of law enforcement example yeah i just give you that now the freedom of opinion expression it is considered dangerous it is the same feeling that as when i was actually students in the 80s and even a joke it is considered the enemy of the state and of course the independent institution is forced to be part of the executive with very very dubious process i just give you the darkest moments in my life in akpk while we are really receiving the support from the people but the parliaments and the palace actually close their door to consult us we don't they were not just consulting us they we don't even actually read the draft of a kpk bill so the real boy of reformers it is slaughters under my watch and it was one of the darkest moment in my kpk life and what is the result in six months the image of kpk actually decreased almost 40 percent but let's hope I like the opening of the book in page 12 it is stating them in our allies you serious front indeed along with every hardships is a relief and Kartini already said habis gelap terbit terang unfortunately we travel toward darkness so that's why I think it is true, reformasi belum selesai, and we need more Indonesian democratic project. Let me finish this. From Heidi Mendoza, fighting corruption is like being a mother. You have no right to stop, and giving up is not an option. Panjang umur perjuangan. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for your remarks and your discussion there, uh, Dr. Sharif. Uh, that leaves um, a lot for us to discuss now as we enter uh, question and answer time. Already we have um, a few hands up and also some questions. Uh, but before we get to that, um, can I please ask Professor Emil Salim um, if you would like to respond for a few minutes to 
uh, the discussion points that uh, Dr. Sharif uh, has just uh, said. We would love to hear from you first before we open up to the floor. I see. Hello? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you, Prof. Laude is a man of action. He lives with the problem and he tries to solve it. What he experienced is not theory. It's not something that you make a paper in a book. It's reality. And the sadness that we face is that this reality is continuing under the eyes of the ruling elite. But I still am looking for a fire of hope and watching Laude still fighting in spite of his difficulties that he has faced, I think there is still hope. In the words of the prophet of the Al-Quran, after difficulties will arise the days of promises. So I think I support what Laude has said and that explains we must know the reality of the issue to cope with the problem. The time of, of not taking, the, not talking the truth is over. Knowing the truth, the way is now open to discuss bluntly how to solve the problem. And I hope Laude is following that road to find a solution with this big and large experience. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Professor Salim. Uh, okay, now we're gonna go to our question and answer. And um, we're gonna do it is we are going to uh, take three questions at a time. And before uh, every question, can I please ask um, uh, those of you who are asking the question to first of all, introduce yourself, tell us your institutional affiliation. And if you are um, asking the question to somebody in particular in the panelists, uh, please say who in particular you're addressing the question to. And please, um, can I ask that you ask your questions uh, quite briefly, uh, because we wanna get through as many questions as possible. I know that first of all, we've got Frank Fulner. Uh, I, I, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. So Frank, uh, please, if you want to uh, unmute yourself, introduce yourself and please ask your question, which I believe is on the issue of polarization. Frank, Frank Foilner. Yes, thank you very much for the opportunity and congratulations to this event. This is really fascinating to hear uh, and to have all the uh, opinions voiced today. My question is, is on the point uh, of polarization that was uh, discussed by Ellen, I think, and uh, also picked up by Eve. In some countries, the coronavirus is seen uh, to unify citizens, whereas in others, the crisis is polarizing even more. So my question is, would you say, uh, um, how is the impact in Indonesia of the pandemic? Great, thank you very much uh, there, Frank. Um, and um, I'm gonna go to the second question, uh, which is from Khalil Roter. So Khalil, uh, please uh, introduce yourself first and um, ask your question. Hi, morning. Uh, my name is Khalil Roter. Uh, I'm a lecturer at the University of Indonesia in the economic faculty. My question actually is uh, how uh, deterioration of democracy would affect uh, economic growth, the trajectory of economic growth and welfare distribution. That's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for that, uh, Khalil. And lastly, for the third question in this round, uh, I'm going to go to Dr. Alexander Arifianto. Um, so please uh, state your question. Thank you very much. Uh, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you, Alex. Uh, hi. Uh, this is Alex Arifianto from Rajaratnam School of International Studies, RSIS in Singapore. I have a question for both uh, Tom and Eve. Uh, the first question is, uh, uh, we haven't heard much about uh, uh, the role of uh, civil service or the bureaucracy when it comes to uh, uh, the, the, the democratic regression in Indonesia over, over the past uh, several years. Uh, could you please elaborate on, on how, how is the regression of the civil service uh, uh, play a role in this and how does that, this relate to the 
uh, weak, seemingly weak capacity of uh, the civil service in handling the COVID-19 pandemic uh, right now. Uh, the second question is uh, uh, basically people have, uh, uh, based, on, based on my you know, over a decade research in Indonesia, I know that people I interview always uh, uh, talk about how they are genuine, how they are tired about democracy, some of them wanted to re return to democracy Pancasila or democracy terpimpin and so forth. So we know that this uh, attitude about, you know, uh, uh, the, the lack of support from democracy from below is out there. How do you think this attitude gets uh, amplified uh, during the past five years? And how do, how do, do you think uh, the elite uh, uses this uh, sentiment to try to uh, basically uh, 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 decreases this uh, democracy by taking taking the cues from what uh, the public have expressed about the uh, Nuhan about the uh, democracy. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much for that question, Alex. Uh, I might go with the first question first, and I'm, I want to invite, first of all, maybe Alan uh, to talk about uh, the issue of polarization, uh, and particularly in the pandemic, whether it unifies or divides citizens. Uh, and perhaps after that, I'm going to either go to Eve or, um, or Tom to talk about it within the context of Indonesia. Please. Yeah, I, I, I guess I would just echo what uh, the, the, the nature of the question, right? So we see globally that, that that we've got one or two, one, one or two responses, right? That, that, that the um, pandemic either sort of unifies, uh, unifies governments and strengthens support for governments um, or uh, polarizes and, and, um, and uh, further divides uh, both people from, from government and divides society, uh, uh, cleaves society in interesting ways. What the pandemic I think really does is a stress test for whatever the institutions are. So it sort of reveals the weaknesses of, uh, of a country's institutions, reveals weaknesses in sort of the democratic or not or, 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 uh, or political framework. Uh, and I think that's what we're seeing uh, around the world, including Indonesia. But I'll let my Indonesian colleagues speak to whether, um, uh, what, with the extent of polarization around the pandemic in Indonesia. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll step in really briefly. It's a fantastic question. And I think the, the answer is that we don't really know yet. So um, at, at what we do know is that at the elite level, what that pre-existing kind of state of polarization did was that it created uh, conflict and the politicization of the response, both kind of at the beginning of the pandemic and more recently in this kind of very devastating second wave. Uh, so, you know, the kind of when, when Anis Baswede and the governor of Jakarta um, and also kind of almost now a sort of um, figurehead for the Islamist opposition against Jokowi, when he wanted to come down hard and with a lockdown in the early days, uh, the Jokowi administration tried to stop him. And that was kind of infused in that sort of kind of center, um, center region kind of conflict was this pre-existing uh, polarization between the pluralist incumbent government and a governor who was affiliated with the Islamist opposition. And it slowed down the response, it confused the response, and it was really dangerous. And we've seen again, uh, I mean, things are kind of resolving now, but initially when uh, Anis tried to really come down with the lockdown, and it was a late lockdown anyway, when cases were just spiraling out of control in Jakarta and hospitals are filling up. Again, the central government uh, tries to overrule him or constrain him or negotiate some sort of other outcome. And so that kind of, that pre-existing polarization kind of comes through in um, how the central government uh, connects with and coordinates with regional governments and especially Jakarta um, because of that sort of um, ideological differences between the two, the two governments. Um, the other way that I think, the other question though is what's going on at the, at the uh, community level. Um, and in some ways you've got, to, you, you've got to sort of think that this devastating unprecedented tragedy that's unfolding in parts of the country, especially in the urban centres, you know, does that kind of, does that sort of turn people against the central government because, and you kind of get this shared sort of tragedy and this shared frustration with the central government. So some of the divisions at the community level might sort of begin to ease potentially. But I, you know, the evidence that we have so far, like if we look at polls, for example, is that people are experiencing and seeing this um, pandemic almost through a partisan lens. So um, most, mostly people are still okay with the government's response. We haven't had a recent poll in the last month, but previous polls show that most people are kind of relatively satisfied, around 60% or so satisfied with the government response. But once you dig down and, and divide that into kind of pro jokowi anti jokowi camps, the majority of the, of, so people who supported Jokowi in the first place 
still support him. And the people who didn't support him in the first place are really unhappy with the government's response to the pandemic. So there's kind of, I guess that's the two ways that we can see it playing out. What, what I don't see evidence of yet is what Alan just referred to, that sort of, you know, that this shared tragedy kind of, you know, sort of starts to kind of help heal those divisions. I haven't seen evidence of that yet, but whether it gets worse or not, only time will tell. And I don't know, um, I was just going to say that we've, you know, PUSPA has done this um, chapter on the economic sort of uh, dimensions of democratic decline. But fortunately, we have Park Emil here, who's an economist. Maybe he could answer that question. Yeah. yeah <laughs> uh, thank you very much for that, for that, Eve. Um, I want to go to the second question now, just so that we have uh, time to go to um, all the questions. Uh, I actually want to invite um, Prof. Emil Salim to answer uh, Khalil's question. And um, also, uh, Puspa, um, I know that you are one of the panelists. If you want to chime in, um, perhaps after pa, uh, pa Emil has finished, uh, please feel free to do so as well. So, Prof. Uh, Prof. Salim, uh, if you would like to answer the question. What is the question? Can you repeat the question? Uh, yes, the question is, how would the deterioration of, democ of democracy adversely affect economic growth and welfare distribution? Yeah, well, first, there's a positive relationship between democracy that is based on people's participation and that if it is conducted well, will stimulate growth. There's this connection. The effects are that the participant in the current development is not the mass of the people. It is the happy few. It's the conglomerates. And as such, it affects negatively democracy. Those candidates are, are, are forced, are, I mean, are they don't have the money. The good guys don't have the money. So they become bad guys because they need the money of the conglomerates. Otherwise, they cannot become bupatis or governor. So the situation, the system of election, the, the restriction of being part of, in the parliament, the part, political parties entering the, par, in the, in the parliament is restricted. That system makes a way of political which is uh, corrupted. And as such, the democracy will not positively affect, that kind of democracy will not affect positively growth. Great, thank you very much. Uh, just briefly, um, I'm gonna ask one of our panelists who's also actually speaking in the second day of the book launch tomorrow, uh, um, Dr. Puspa Delima Amri from Sonoma State University. And um, because you have a ch chapter in the book actually called The Economic Dimensions of Indonesia's Democratic Decline. Uh, Puspa, can I ask you to comment a little bit on this question? Sure, thank you, Char Charlotte, and thank you, everyone. Uh, my Emil already has a really great answer, but I'll just chime in with two more additional supplements. One way is by making economic policies less accountable to public interests. The same checks and balances that function to constrain would be, would be autocrats, in the words of Alan just now, also serves to ensure that economic policies that are implemented truly reflect public interests. Well, how is public interest defined or aggregated? Ideally, among others, through political parties. Uh, so a weak political party could also indirectly contribute to weakening economic outcomes that Finally, democratic equality that is declining reduces the public space to truly debate and discuss the pros and cons of various economic policies. So those are the views, the additional uh, comments that I might have to add to Professor Salim's question, uh, answer earlier. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you so much for that, Puspa. And I wanna go now to Alex uh, Arifianto's question on civil service and bureaucracy. And, and for this question, maybe I can love the question to, uh, first of all, Alan, and also to uh, Dr. Sharif, uh, who I know has a lot of experience, uh, particularly with, uh, with uh, dealing with civil service and, and, and bureaucracy um, in, in democracy. I was gonna to respond to the, the second part of Alex's question. So why don't we have Dr. Sharif uh, respond to the, the, the first part, then I can do the second part. Oh, sure. Pasharim, do you have a, a response to um, Alex Arifianto's question before? Oh, Pasharim, you're on mute. Um, yes, please. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I kind of like uh, lost in the question. So can you just repeat it? Because I think it was about economic, right? But I don't really 
Uh, no, uh, actually, uh, Alex Arifianto's question was more about uh, the role of civil service and also the bureaucracy um, and, and their contributions in, um, in uh, Indonesia's democratic decline. Um, Alex, um, please, could you please type in your questions again? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I think it is, uh, I think someone actually, I think it is Bambang Harimurti, I think he is on the panelist actually, uh, he told me. If you try to classify the public servant, you have to classify it into three. The good one, in the middle, and the bad one. So in Indonesian context, mostly it is depend, and the majority actually in the middle. So you have like very few good one, and you have very few bad one. So it is actually determined by the leaders. If the leader is it actually good, they follow it. So in the bad apples, it you know, cannot be used at all. What really happened at the moment, I think, we do not have that. I mean, good leaders, only will. Okay, I'm very sorry to the minister of health, for example. The president appointed the Minister of Health, but the medical, the ED, the medical association community itself actually rejecting him. So that's why it is so difficult to trust him to manage doctors because the doctors, since the beginning, they already sent a letter of a complaint to the president not to appoint him as a minister because they consider him is not like science-based kind of doctors. And this is actually proof in the management of COVID. So you can actually see the role of the Ministry of health it is very limited it is actually even actually managed by coordinator ministry of marine affairs or, or ministry of uh, state owned companies uh, the ministry of foreign affairs i don't see that in other country and this is also deteriorated because of the political corruptions, you see bad, many bad governors. Uh, so actually it is so difficult for these people in the middle to be good. I think this is the one and only answer and that answers are attributed to Babamang Harimurti who actually uh, said in several discussion with me in the past. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharif. And before we go to Alan um, to talk about this authoritarian nostalgia, which is uh, which is the second part of Alan's, uh, sorry, um, Alex's question. I know that Tom, uh, you wanted to uh, add to Dr. Sharif's comments. Yeah, just adding something very brief. I think what Pat Laudes just said is is really compelling. Um, there are two aspects of this that I think are worth paying some attention to. Firstly, if you're in the civil service, I think for the vast majority of civil servants you're compromised from the start of your career because in order to get a civil service job, as we know, you have to pay money, right? You have to pay money. You then have to re, you know, recoup your initial investment. And so this means that most people in the service, civil service are legally compromised. So the degree to which they can provide a bulwark against democratic deconsolidation, I think is very limited. I think they tend to follow along with those who sit higher up in the hierarchy. The second issue that I think is worth <clears throat> paying attention to is the way in which the contemporary societal polarization has also infected the civil service. And there is an effort by the incumbent government to purge uh, elements of the civil service that they believe are um, in inverted commas Islamist or who have Islamist sympathies. And we saw this actually not in regard to a civil service institution, but in regard to the KPK itself, as Pat Laoda would know, right? Where you have this so-called uh, Taliban faction um, that is allegedly uh, within the KPK and that then provides the government with part of its sort of its uh, 
reasoning or its rationale for the, the decimation of that institution. This pervades virtually the entire civil service at the national level and is also widespread at the sub-national level. So just a, a brief comment to add to what um, Pat Lowe had already said. Thank you. And Alan, for the second part of the question from Alex before about uh, about the sense of nostalgia and boredom towards uh, dem democracy in Indonesia so far. Yeah, I, I'll be very brief. Um, I, I think Alex hit on a, on a real danger in uh, in many democracies under stress, uh, public dissatisfaction, public embrace of the idea of democracy, but deep dis dissatisfaction about the fruits of their their particular democracy. And that's and that that's part of the reason why I think and this um, while I agree with all of the sentiments that have been expressed in terms of the, the, the deep problems with Indonesian democracy, I think we, it's useful for us to temper our words with, uh, with, with not just the, the, you know, seeing the problems and knowing the truth clearly, but also recognizing some of the, you know, the, the, strengths, the, the strengths and the achievements of Indonesian democracy, um, uh, recognizing the flaws, recognizing the problems, but also realizing that um, democracy, if, you believe, if we believe this, and I do, that democracy in Indonesia is worth saving, right? That it's not, there's a, there's a danger in, when, uh, um, that, that we see uh, everywhere and in lots of countries that, um, that a focus on, a, a sole focus on the problems uh, leads to a democratic fatalism, uh, helplessness to hopelessness, where people just say, what's the point? It doesn't matter anyway. Form of government doesn't matter. Um, and it, that's, that's the breeding ground for autocrats and populists. And so uh, I just, uh, while not being naive, uh, we want to we wanna also recognize that, um, that there are things we're saving about Indonesia's, Indonesian democracy, and it's worth defending, I guess would, would be my, uh, my comment. Thank you very much for that, Alan. Um, we, we're going to go now to our second round of three questions. Um, I've got a, a question here, first of all, from Nino Pambudi, who is from Compass. Um, and uh, Nino's question is, maybe I missed the discussion, but I haven't heard the influence of capitalism in the stagnation or regression of Indonesia's democracy. Also, I'd like to hear more about Tom's comment that the elites are the main actors in the stag in stagnating the democracy, yet we have direct elections. How can we strengthen the political and economy, um, the, the political sphere, I guess, and economy in Indonesia? So, uh, Tom, I think that question is predominantly for you. Um, so thank you very much for that, Nino. And we've also got two other um, questions uh, here. First of all, from Amira Waldi. So Amira, I know you're um, asking your question live. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you, Charlotte. I think uh, my question is correlated with what Budin already uh, asked. So I don't see the, uh, a good uh, community participation in our democracy. And uh, this is the core of democracy itself. So how we answer this, uh, you know, like um, situation, uh, how can we say that we have a good democracy if we don't have a good community participation? What we can see is apathy and just like, you know, let it be and how we can improve this. I'm Amira Wahdi, by the way, from UGM Jakarta. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Amira. And I know that the next question, which is from Greg Bauer, who is from the U.S. Embassy, I believe, in Jakarta. Uh, Greg, your question is about uh, civil, so civil society as well. Greg, please. Yes, uh, this is Greg following up on uh, Blue Mayor's question in regards to civil society, uh, especially under PSPP and increasing digitalization within civil society. There's a threat that's often talk it, talked about of creation of digital enclaves, uh, essentially like-minded individuals talking with each other. And that with that sort of the millennial hope, as it were, of a reintegration reinvigorated civil society might also increase polarization because you're no longer having a uh, dialogue across ideologies. You're having mobilization between ideologies. Uh, so the question is, you know, how do you mobilize civil society in a way that can challenge power of elites while also avoiding the trap of creating uh, polarization because of the digital platforms that are being used? Great, thank you very much. Let's go to uh, answering the first question, uh, first of all, from Ibu Ninu. That's Tom. Tom. Yeah. Sorry, this is the question about elites, about- Yes, uh, so- Elites so in main actors that they were doing direct elections? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, so uh, I'm not arguing that elites are the 
only drivers of democratic deterioration. So Eve and I were, I think, reflecting on different aspects or different drivers of democratic deterioration. And this is the way that we've structured our analysis in the introduction to the volume. Um, but on that question of how elites can be seen as, you know, among the primary drivers or um, perhaps arguably the primary drivers of democratic deterioration, despite the fact that there are direct elections. I think that this is a very widespread phenomenon in autocratization or democratic regression, where you see the institutions which can uh, provide accountability beyond elections being eroded and elections being retained as a means of um, uh, sort of providing a mandate for basically elite domination of the political sphere beyond electoral cycles, right? And we see this in many places that would be considered um, full-blown uh, competitive authoritarian systems. So the presence of elections, the presence of direct elections does not guarantee what might be considered effective democratic institutions more broadly. And in fact, sometimes it can distract from the deterioration of those institutions beyond the electoral cycles. And I, I, might, just add, I might just add to that, that one of the most concerning trends we're seeing is the sort of even as Indonesian elections appear competitive, the kinds of candidates that get to run in elections, that's become actually more and more sort of restricted and narrow. So as uh, Pat Laoda pointed out, we're getting uh, the sort of the backgrounds of the people running for office, the choices that people have, most of them are coming from the business community or from the sort of bureaucracy. So you're getting far fewer kind of activists and scholars and teachers and people from those sorts of backgrounds as the price of politics has gone up. And then the most recent Pilkada that's coming up that apparently will still be going ahead despite the pandemic, I think the number of Chalon Tungal, where there's just one candidate running, has doubled since the last Pilkada Sarenta. So you have these like it's Pamilu Tampa Pilihan, like you have like you have elections, but the choices that people are getting are sort of getting narrower and narrower. So people have the power to go out and vote, but do they have a lot of say in precisely the quality of the candidate they're choosing? I think that's where we're seeing a lot of sort of erosion as well. Um, yeah. Um, Eve, if I can, while you're on the line, I might get you to also comment on the question from um, Amira, uh, Ibu Amira Wadi from UGM in Yogyakarta um, regarding community participation in democracy in Indonesia. Uh, and she seconded Pat Laudi's comments before um, and, uh, you know, regarding apathy and, you know, critical thinking and all that. How can we claim that we have a good democracy in Indonesia if there is no participation from the people? And how may we proof uh, sort of more grassroots political participation? Well, yeah, it's a really hard question, but it is, it kind of touches on this, again, this irony that Indonesia has one of the highest sort of rates of participation in elections in the world. People go out to vote all the time. Uh, they have so many elections all the time. So that's a really positive thing, in fact. Um, but at the same time, the degree to which politicians are interacting with their voters, are hearing what voters want, the degree of civil society participation in, in uh, developing laws and regulations. I mean, the mining sector regulation, uh, law, new law is a perfect example of how this process has been eroded. In the 2009 mining law, and I know civil society activists complained about this at the time, but there was, on the face of it, a lot of interaction. There were people, you know, NGOs were brought to hearings in the DPR um, to kind of develop this law. That wasn't done at all with this latest mining law and, and with huge implications for the environment, for the communities that live around mining sites. So we have an, an elite that is you have a, so I guess it's a very negative response that I'm, that I'm giving here, but you have a kind of elite that's making it more and more difficult, that's more will, less and less willing to engage with civil society organisations uh, uh, and a whole set of political elected um, elites who interact less and less with their voters uh, and who are coming from a more narrow set of backgrounds. So it's very difficult. And maybe I can lead to someone else here, maybe even Alan or, or Lada to, to answer that question about you know, where we do have activism, and we have a lot of online activism in Indonesia, we have really good and interesting initiatives like Kawal Pamilu, that kind of community-based um, organisations that are out there trying to absorb, observe elections, check elections. We have a, is it Kawal Coffee? The, the, the kind of, um, yeah, right. another community-based organisation that said, we don't trust the government's information on COVID, so we're going to monitor it. So you still have so much um, important and fascinating and in really impressive civil society mobilization in Indonesia. But I want to maybe ask someone else to come in and say, does it, is it effective enough when it's so much of it's online? And how does that kind of uh, evolve in such a polarized landscape? I don't know if someone else wants to step in there. <laughs> is actually answering also Greg Bauer's question regarding the increasing digitalization of civil society. 
visualization, <laughs> right? Um, you know, I would I want to invite maybe Tom, um, Alan, if you want to answer this question, and and maybe perhaps even uh, Pat Laude, who's on the ground and experiencing this on a day to day basis. Tom, maybe you want to go first, or Alan, please. I I just 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 very briefly. Um, uh, I think one of the challenges with, with civil society everywhere, uh, digital or not, is sort of connecting acti activity and activism and passion, um, uh, the grassroots to, uh, to actually the machinery of government and machinery of policymaking. And, and sometimes we can do that. Sometimes that's done via, via institutions and, and sort of norms. And that had been more the case in Indonesia past, less the case as, as you just very, very, um, uh, very, very carefully said uh, just now. Um, but the other thing, the other way that these these groups uh, get uh, often get linked are through political parties again. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, and and that's also another way we sort of combat the sort of um, uh, the pillarization or the isolation of uh, the polarization that can happen on these online communities is parties that transcend any one group, right, and bring these groups together uh, around common sets of issues uh, uh, that sort of aggregate these interests, as Tom uh, referred to. Uh, and so, again, uh, one, one possibility for improved uh, representation and voice uh, uh, by these groups is to uh, are reforms to the party system that, could, that, do, that, that better connect parties to voters than voters to parties, parties to groups, groups to parties. Maybe I can add something just briefly on that question of the online sort of dimension of civil society discourse. I think that one of the aspects that we haven't really discussed um, is the spread of what are, what are sort of often referred to as bots, um, uh, what's this term, buzzers, right, in Indonesia. So you have people who are um, actually genuine human beings presenting a particular position online, but the government and opposition groups, uh, you know, they very often do buy um, digital, sort of echo chambers that can then be blasted out to people who are following certain accounts and we can get you know certain topics and certain hashtags trending on twitter so the degree to which that's reflective of civil society or sort of this intra-elite um war online i'm i'm a little bit unsure of i think for the vast majority of indonesians uh, what we see in the sort of the online echo chambers are not that relevant to their day-to-day -day experiences of politics um just a, a little aside on that Yes, and um, thank you very much for that, Tom. Pasharif, do you have anything to add to that or, or not? You're happy with uh, how things are now? Pasharif, you're on mute. Uh, not, uh, but I think I think there is a question from Maninu or uh, Mardiana from Compass. I think this is very important one. Uh, I think it is not my area, but I think there are so many panelists can actually answer her questions. For uh, she said, maybe I missed the discussion, but I haven't heard the influence of capitalism in the stagnation or regression of Indonesian democracy. Uh, uh, I'd like to have more about some comments on that. And I think uh, we are hijacked by them, actually. Uh, it is kind of like outside of my expertise, but I hope some of you can actually entertain that very important questions. And I can give you empirical evidence later on based on the case. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I just want to uh, remind everybody, sorry, like the discussion's going so great. Uh, the time is actually now uh, 11.38 p.m. Uh, Jakarta time, right? So we've gone way um, over time. Uh, maybe if I can just uh, let either Eve or Tom comment on the question from um, Nino before about capitalism. And also, um, we have one final question from Bambang Harimurti, who wants to ask a question. Uh, so just quickly, perhaps. Um, I, I, yeah, I would just actually point to what to Laoda's presentation. I think he did a fantastic job of demonstrating the degree to which Indonesia's democracy kind of runs on patronage and on money, um, and how that is really at the root of so many of the problems of representation uh, in Indonesia's democracy, and at the root of the problem of kind of the exclusion of voters in civil society from accessing the kind of the halls of power. So I don't, I don't think I want to add much more to that, but it is a really, really important point, and there's a lot of work being done on like by Edward Aspinall. What Baron Shot, what Muhtadi on precisely this problem, because it really is at the core, I think, 
of, of um, the, the problems in the party system and the problems with representation. That's all I'll say. And then this will be our last question. Yeah, about Charlotte, because I know that I know it's really late in Michigan for Alan. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for that, Alan. So very last question, and this is from Bambang Harimurti. So please, Bambang. Bambang Harimurti. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Exactly. I just want to ask. Uh, you know whether Indonesian democracy is going through Philippinization. You know, we are going to become more and more like Philippines where the local landlord or local warlord will become the new elite in all over Indonesia. And the second is uh, nobody has touched about uh, what, um, uh, uh, what's her name, Amya Chu says the market dominating ethnic group in the case of Indonesia, of course, is uh, the Chinese ethnic group, which is different than in uh, Thailand or in Philippines where they have the same religion, but we are more like Malaysia, uh, but the number is very small, but they are very influential in the term of the capitalism capture of the Indonesian politics. And of course, it's create a backlash, uh, which can be uh, a ticking bomb for the future. I was just wondering if uh, all of you can uh, talk about this. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for that, Pak Bambang. For the first part of the question about the Philippinization, potential Philippinization of Indonesian democracy, I want to throw that to Alan, uh, first of all. What do you think about this question, Alan? Well, uh, the Philippine, uh, the Filipinos love that uh, that question, right? Um, the, uh, the the Philippines export to the world is Philippinization of, of Indonesian politics. Um, uh, the it's interesting because and I, I could go on for a long time, but I'll be very brief. Um, I, 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 in several ways, we see that happening, right? The, um, the hollowing out of the party system, uh, mm. the increase in uh, celebrity and high high profile candidates, um, the uh, sort of decentralization of a lot of power and a lot of uh, control of resources at local levels and the sort of rise of local strongmen, local political mm -hmm. machines, all those look like they're, they're in development in Indonesia, which would make it look very much like uh, the Philippines. And that, I guess, just underscores a point I've, I've already made. As, as difficult as things are in Indonesia, they could be worse. And I just want to understand, I just, I just want to, as the compared, as the, the comparativist, uh, the non-Indonesian uh, scholar here, um, there, there, there's, there's, there's still room uh, to, uh, to, 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 to decline, and um, at, but also uh, opportunities to arrest the uh, the fall uh, and not become uh, full blown uh, uh, Philippines or full blown Thailand. Thank you very much for that, Alan. And for the second part of the question, and also maybe if you want to comment on Alan, uh, I want to throw it to the book's editors, Eve and Tom. Can I actually suggest perhaps that you might say something on that, Charlotte, given that you have done serious research in the place of, of the Chinese Indonesians? That's a great uh, idea. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, Eve, you want to comment first before I go to the second part of the question? I need to have a think about this for us. I mean, it's, it's a really sensitive question, right? Um, and it's one that we've been, we've been sort of, I guess as political analysts have been you know, increasingly concerned and worried about a backlash against um, Indone a Chinese Indonesian community ever since the AHOK crisis. Um, so for, sort of from 1998, where there was that real kind of anti-Chinese anti violence and ri riots up until the uh, anti-AHOK um, uh, protests, there'd actually been a period there where we were a real positivity that, the, that um, you know, that um, Chinese Indonesians weren't just being seen as a kind of uh, predatory business elite or something that they were kind of participating in political life and community life in a way that they've never been able to or weren't given credit for during the Saharsho years. Um, and then what those Islamist uh, mobilizations unleashed was this real sense that uh, there's, that, that, that that racism and that discrimination that exists within Indonesia against some of these, um, against the Chinese communities, it's still there, it sort of lies dormant and is ready to be mobilized. And um, that was quite frightening, I think, for, for many within the, um, the Chinese Indonesian community. Now, of course, it is the case, it's undeniable that at the very, very, very kind of top sort of, um, you know, layer of Indonesian business class, that it is still predominantly, um, uh, China, not, not all, but they're predominantly um, uh, Chinese Indonesian owned, they're kind of the largest conglomerates. But that's, um, and so I think that, I'm not really sure what the way the question was going, whether whether it's just sort of whether that fact will always means that that community will always be a sort of um, a target. 
especially in a more polarized, religiously polarized sort of political atmosphere. And I guess um, it's really up to the decisions that political leaders make. You know, do they want to try and mobilize that in the way that Prabhu sort of did uh, in 2014 and to a larger extent 2019? Or do they want to kind of rise above and, and sort of emphasize the kind of pluralist um, foundations of Indonesia? I, I don't know. I'm kind of rambling because I'm not really sure what to do with that question. So I think I think actually Charlotte would be better off at a place. I'm, I'm no. rambling off to give you a chance to think about it, Charlotte. <laughs> no, no, no. Sorry, I didn't expect to answer the question considering that I'm the I'm the chair. But thank you for uh, for letting me comment a little bit on this. And and yeah, thank you very much, Mama, for the question. Um, and, you know, I just want to point that uh, actually this relates to uh, what we were talking about, not in the 2019 Indonesia Update Conference, but in the 2018 um, Indonesia Update Conference that was organized by Greg Feely and Ronit Ritchie uh, from the ANU that actually talks about the place of minorities um, in, this, uh, in this process at, at the beginning or the myths of Indonesia's democratic stagnation and, and regression. Um, and that actually particularly vulnerable uh, minorities with a long history of uh, being the scapegoats whenever there's a political or economic crisis and whenever there's heightened polarization in society, uh, such as the Chinese Indonesians, um, which uh, you, you quoted before, um, the work by um, uh, uh, you know, uh, at uh, market dominant minorities. Uh, so uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, the quality I, um, and the book that uh, Greg Feely and Ronit Ritchie uh, ended up producing from 2018, uh, Indonesia Update, which I have a chapter in uh, as well, actually talks about how the quality of a country's democracy can be also judged by how it treats its ethnic minor its minorities, not just ethnic minorities, but also um, sexual minorities, political minorities, uh, right? And also uh, there are lots of things that we haven't um, been able to discuss in, in this discussion, for instance, social um, inequality, urban rural divide, infrastructure gap, all that sort of stuff, right? Um, so, um, yeah, I guess like, you know, that's another point uh, of danger in this heightened polarization. Um, and I guess I'll just end it at that because, uh, you know, it's also my chair's prerogative to end this sort of on time-ish. Um, so thank you everybody uh, for your questions. And um, I want to thank in particular, um, uh, Professor Emil Salim for launching this wonderful book, uh, and also um, Dr. Laude Sharif uh, for um, discussing the book, uh, Alan Hicken for, uh, for talking to us about your chapter, and huge congratulations for Eve Warburton and Thomas Howard, the editors of this book, Democracy in Indonesia, From Stagnation to Regression, that is now uh, available for sale either online um, uh, through the ANU website, I believe, and also in Indonesia, it's available. There's information about how you can buy the book. Um, and also as a reminder that this is only day one of the book launch uh, for uh, for this book. Uh, and tomorrow at the same time, uh, what's more, Friday, Friday, sorry, Friday, Friday, 25th of September, sorry about that. Um, uh, at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, Jakarta time, uh, we've got book discussions with the authors, uh, some of the authors from the book. We've got Ken Satyawan, Irshad Rafsadi, Diak Ayukartika, Puspad Lima Amri, which, uh, who we've heard, heard from before uh, quickly, Burhan Mutadi, just a number of um, um, authors uh, that will be speaking tomorrow. So please tune Friday. in Friday. on Friday. 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 <laughs> Thursday. Uh, Friday. Uh, thank you very much uh, for everybody uh, and thank you for joining us for this wonderful book launch. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Thank you so much to us. I'm happy to send that, I'm happy to send that uh, PowerPoint, the, I mean, especially the slide of the authors. It was my almost one hour hard work. <laughs> thank you, Pasha. He's my co author. I could have given yeah. you a picture. <laughs> thank, you. Okay. thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye.